This week on Talking Real, we bring in special guest Brian Green from the National Association of Realtors to talk about all the modern issues in fair housing. Not just the history or the obligations, but what's going on today, right now, that will impact fair housing on into the future. So what does the future of fair housing look like? Let's find out. Welcome back to Talking Real, brought to you by the Oklahoma Association of Realtors. This is episode 167 of Talking Real, and we're back in the studio. You're joined here by your host, Jeff and Nabil. And Nabil, tell me how your day is. My day's going great. Uh, Coffee is hitting the spot. That's some (laughs) days it's like that. It'd be like that sometimes. (laughs) Man, we've got some stuff coming up before we get into the meat of this, because this week we've got uh, special guests on the episode, and we brought in Brian Green from the National Association of Realtors to talk about all things fair housing and not just the history, right? Like we've talked about the history mm-hmm. of fair housing, some of the like general requirements of fair housing, but this week we ta- we we get into and it's it's not just this week. We we had so much great content. We're breaking this up over a couple weeks. Special two parter. Special two part series here of just some really important issues that are going on right now. Like these are like modern today issues in the world of fair housing. And so it's it's an important conversation and there's a lot of content. So I'm excited to bring you these next two weeks for sure. Nabil, how do you feel about it? I, I love this conversation. I think it's always so enlightening and, you know, there's always more stuff you can talk about. And I feel like if we didn't have a time restriction, we probably would have. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, we could go in depth on so many of the issues. We'll, like, we'll have a whole a day long podcast about. <laughs> right. Right. And fair housing is so important. Like, I think it's just one of the most important things that we can be talking about. Right. This goes to uh, just access to the American dream of owning a home. Right. right. This is what we're talking about. Or just the ability to have a place to live in a fair, equal way. Right. And there's so many facets to that conversation. I think, I mean, it's a never ending conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. I think every episode of Talking Real is must listen, but these two are especially <laughs> must listen. Uh, so we're excited for that. But first, we've got a couple of things coming up we wanted to let you know about. That's right. Uh, first thing coming up, May 19th is Realtor Day at the Capitol in person. Uh, this is going to be a great event. We're going to start off at the Capitol View Event Center, where we're going to have some lunch and food trucks. And then we're going to transition to the Capitol, where we'll have ice cream. You know, you got to have ice cream at Capitol. Yeah. And you get to meet your legislators and make that contact and that relationship. And best part is it's all free. All free. Do they need to get signed up for that? They do. So if you go on over to okrealtors.com forward slash Capitol Conference, because this is a part of that rescheduling that we did yeah. uh, from the town hall visits and stuff like that. So if you go to okrealtors.com forward slash Capitol Conference, You'll see a link to register for this event and get signed up. It's going to be a lot of fun. Absolutely. Uh, The other event coming up is GRI in June. Uh, We've got another in-person GRI coming up June 2nd and 3rd. This one's going to be in Tulsa. Mm -hmm. So we're going to make the trip up the Turnpike to Tulsa to host GRI up there. Um, I'm excited about it. I get to do a little bit of teaching. I'm going to teach a few hours of contracts. Nice. uh, Jeff's favorite topic. Everybody knows I love, (laughs) you know, Contracts is just one of my favorite things to talk about. So I'm going to get to do a few hours of, of contracts there, along with a, a ton of other great instructors. I think we're going to be doing Broker Relationship Act. Um, I'm not sure what else is on the on top there, but there's a number of really great uh, appraisals. Appraisals. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Lee Caesar Jr. I think is going to be coming to teach that who we just had on the podcast mm-hmm. uh, last week, week before, so just within the last week or two. Yeah. And that uh, I actually got some feedback from out in the field. Oh yeah. When I was uh, hanging out with some friends who are realtors and they're like, I heard that episode and he's like, I feel like I always say this, but that episode was really, really good. Good. <laughs> Love that feedback. So that was great. Yeah. So if you want to get started on your GRI or if you're already started, this is going to be a, a module that you're going to need if you haven't had it yet. If you have had it, hey, come take it again and, and get some new insight on some different things. So you can get signed up at that by going to okrealtors.com forward slash events. That is correct. And so I was like, maybe? <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but events, 
okrealtors.com forward slash events. So get signed up for that. It's going to be a great two day, June 2nd and 3rd educational opportunity. And I personally look forward to seeing you all out there. <laughs> so come say what's up and tell me your favorite episode of Talking Real if you're a listener. There you go. There. Jeff will have some special treats for you. <laughs> <laughs> Nabil's making promises for me now. Okay. <laughs> well, let's just get right into this conversation. Part one of Modern Issues in Fair Housing with Brian Green from the National Association of Realtors. Let's do it. Nabil, we've got another special guest here on Talking Real, and this time we've got Brian Green from the National Association of Realtors. He is the Vice President of Policy Advocacy, and I'm excited about this one. I, I'm, I, I get excited about all of our guests, <laughs> but uh, man, we're going to have some really good stuff to talk about today. Yeah, yeah, we are. So, Brian, let's uh, let's get right into this. How, how are you today? Great. Great to see you guys. You too. Yeah. We just really appreciate you giving us some time. We know... Uh, you guys at NAR always have have more more stuff to do than, than you got time for. So giving us a little time here in Oklahoma to talk about some of these issues, because today we wanted to get into some fair housing topics. And, you know, we've talked about on our podcast in the past sort of history of fair housing and some of the, you know, legal requirements of fair housing and, and that kind of stuff. But we've got a lot of issues going on today in 2021 that relate to fair housing. And so we wanted to bring you in to talk about some of the things going on at HUD, um, some of the things that that President Biden has done related to fair housing and just a variety of issues. And so uh, we appreciate your expertise on that. And um, like we said, I guess to start with, can you give all of our listeners a little bit of your background um, before we kind of get into the meat of this? Sure, sure. So, um, well, I'm here in Washington, D.C. today talking to you. Uh, I've lived in the nation's capital for more than half my life now. Uh, it's hard to believe. Uh, I'm originally a New Yorker, um, and I, I lived up in Boston uh, for about six months, sorry, six years <laughs> as well. And so, uh, yeah, so, you know, on the East Coast, you would know that as the Northeast Corridor, you know, on Amtrak. So I've lived in those three cities pretty much. Uh, and um, I, I spent much of my professional career focusing on fair housing issues. And uh, I came to NAR from HUD, where I oversaw HUD's Office of Fair Housing um, for the last decade. I sort of worked myself, uh, worked my way up through HUD to, to lead the fair housing uh, the Fair Housing Office uh, for the last 10 years. Then I came over to NAR as, a, as its first Fair Housing Director and did that for a year. And now I oversee all of our uh, policy advocacy on all issues, which is fascinating. So um, so yeah, so that, that's, that's really my history, um, federal government and, and now uh, National Trade Association. That's I feel like we're kindred spirits there. I spent the first 10 years of my career in state government here in Oklahoma and then now working for our state association. So I'm just, I'm like yeah. the Oklahoma version. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You That's look funny. a bit like me too. But I, you know, understand that like that, that government experience is, is very unique and valuable in many ways and, and having that seeing behind the walls, right? Because there's a lot of mm. perceptions of government institutions. And I think with respect to HUD, as we're talking about fair housing today, you know, we hear people in real estate that they're, they're, they're scared of HUD and all this. And it's like, you know, listen, you should call those people and talk to them if you have questions because they will give you very valuable information. Yeah. So. Not so scary now that I'm not there anymore, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get into this because um, as we're talking about housing discrimination, fair housing, as we sit today, what do you think are some of HUD's biggest priorities that are relating to that housing discrimination that you think realtors should be aware of? Well, you know, um, I, I think we should believe them when they say that uh, racial equity and fair housing generally is a top priority now for the agency. Uh, the Biden administration came out of the gate saying that, uh, and they actually are emphasizing racial equity throughout the administration. And uh, they've also highlighted other fair housing issues uh, as a priority at HUD. So for example, uh, protection of rights for LGBTQ persons, they have uh, said uh, will be a priority and that they are at HUD going to interpret the Fair Housing Act as a 
extending rights to LGBTQ plus persons. So, um, so just everything that we've seen in a hundred days has really underscored that they intend to do a lot in this space. And uh, you know, we had HUD Secretary Marsha Fudge come to NAR to speak uh, on April 15th for Big Fair Housing Month program. And we were one of the, the first trade associations, I think maybe one of the, the first external uh, uh, entities that she came to speak to. So um, I think that says quite a bit about uh, their priorities. Yeah, I think it's it's going to be interesting to see how that changes. And man, there's a lot in there that I feel like we could do podcast episodes on <laughs> many of those topics individually. So we're trying to fit a lot in, but um, yeah. So you mentioned the new administration coming in. So I guess give us an idea of um, the things that have been done in this first hundred days. I've I've seen that there were some executive orders that were done. So maybe if you can give us a little bit of insight into what the Biden administration has done on that front. Sure, you know, obviously they said a lot and the real test is going to be uh, you know, whether the rubber hits the road and, and what the tires look like when they do. But what I have seen so far, say, for example, on disparate impact is uh, the Biden administration coming in and saying, this is a very important legal theory for proving housing discrimination and that they uh, intend for um, the government to take a look and see how it can be uh, best implemented. And then when Marsha Fudge came to speak to us at NAR uh, a couple of weeks ago, she said that they now have a proposed um, regulatory action at uh, the Office of Management and Budget that they're intending to drop. So that is one example that they said this is a priority and within 100 days uh, they are already talking about uh, regulatory action that would effectively uh, reinstate an obama era regulation that the trump administration had um, I, won't, I won't say reversed but had, had uh, significantly modified and uh, if, if all indications are, are true this administration says that they are reverting to where they, to the rule that they put out uh, during the Obama years. And we can talk more about this because this is an interesting topic in and of itself, what disparate impact is, if you think that's something of interest to people. Right, and that's uh, exactly what I was about to ask you. You mentioned disparate in impact. And just in case there's someone out there that doesn't quite know what it is, what is disparate impact in a nutshell? And how did that rule evolve slash come around? Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I hope people don't spend too much time out there thinking about disparate impact because <laughs> it is kind of a, a wonky legal theory. Uh, and because it is, uh, many people who hear it or, or, or try to understand it often get lost. But I'm going to try to make it as simple as possible. Uh, the bottom line is that discrimination can occur in different ways. And the courts have long recognized that people don't necessarily announce their discriminatory purpose. And if you look at the history of our country, you go even back to the 19th century and the period after the Civil War when African-Americans were gaining uh, freedoms and gaining the right to vote. Um, there are always efforts to um, strip those rights. And that's, that's largely what happened, say, in, in, in voting uh, in the 1870s, state after state passed, um, passed uh, constitutions that on their face suggested that everyone could vote, but you can't vote, for example, if your grandfather couldn't vote, uh, or uh, if you uh, want to vote, you've got to pass a literacy test. And all of these things on their face, you could argue, were consistent with the 15th Amendment because they didn't say blacks can't vote. Um, but in practice, you know, uh, blacks grandfathers didn't vote. Uh, that was the, where the grandfather clause came from. Uh, or in, in practice, 
Blacks who were not allowed to go to school or be educated uh, or is allowed the opportunity to learn to read are not going to pass a literacy test. And so those are just examples of neutral policies that, you know, on their face, someone could argue was consistent with the Constitution, but in effect, uh, disenfranchised Black voters. The same principle has been applied in employment and in uh, housing. And the courts, you know, as soon as the Fair Housing Act was passed in 1968, recognized that there were neutral practices or policies um, which may have been designed to harm or exclude certain populations. But the courts have said, you don't have to prove the intent, uh, but there is a framework the courts set out how you can show that it's discriminatory. So it kind of show you show the statistics, you know, how it affects a particular population. And then you go in and ask the defendants, um, the people who have adopted this, to explain why they did it. And if the explanation doesn't really further a real legitimate business necessity, um, and if they can't achieve whatever purpose they've articulated in some less discriminatory way, the plaintiff wins and, and it, it's deemed discrimination. That in a nutshell is disparate impact. It's a, a, a basically a principle um, that's been around for ages and it's been around since the beginning of the Fair Housing Act, but designed to recognize that uh, people disguise their actual intent. But if you can show that it serves no legitimate business need, um, you, can, you can dismantle that policy or practice. So the, the Biden administration is saying the Supreme Court in 2015 said this is unlawful and um, that we don't want to tinker too much with the Supreme Court um, rendering there with regulation. And they, they're going back to a simpler, straightforward regulation, which they say is in better alignment with the Supreme Court decision than uh, a Trump regulation that came out uh, last year, which actually a federal court enjoined from ever being implemented. So technically, um, nothing's really changed on disparate impact since the Supreme Court decision in 2015. So hopefully that wasn't too deep, uh, but uh, <laughs> that's disparate impact in a nutshell. Uh, you know, discrimination that where where the intent may be hidden. Yeah, mm. we've talked about this in some of the classes we've taught. Um, have helped with some fair housing classes as well as some you know property management classes where it comes up quite frequently. And it's funny you mentioned that. What is the business purpose? Because questions come up of well, if I've got a policy of this and the we always ask, well, why do you want to do it? What is your legitimate business reason for having that policy? And if they're like, well, I don't know, I just think it's what I should be doing. You're like, well, then you maybe need to revisit it if you don't have a really, if you can't articulate a good business reason for why you have that policy, you need to- Especially if it's having an effect, right? You know, right. Excluding a large, sec, you know, particular segment. It, and I think that's the point. It leaves the impression that you implemented it perhaps with yeah. animus. Yep. So moving in a little bit different direction, um, something that we've talked about before on the podcast were related to some of the online tools and how you can advertise properties. Facebook, for example, has been sued and they've run into some issues, um, I think, on the regulatory front as well, that some of the ways they allowed people to advertise was way too too granular in a way where it was clearly creating i mean i this probably falls within that disparate impact to to a large degree actually but kind of wanted to get an idea of where are we um, nationally in terms of not just facebook and some of the advertising tools they had um, but just more broadly what are we seeing in that front that these advertising tools that are maybe designed for a broader purpose than just housing but they give people the tools to be very discriminatory if they're not paying attention to what they're doing. Uh, and is there, is there any kind of regulation coming around that, that we should be aware of and then how people are advertising online with some of these tools that aren't specifically for real estate? Yeah, no, beautiful question. Um, so, um, so I was at HUD when Facebook implemented this uh, or when we learned that Facebook uh, had this advertising platform 
uh, that allowed essentially uh, for housing providers to target their ads based on race. Uh, and I, I, this is this is not disparate impact. This is like straight up, you know, treating people differently and and saying, you know, I only want to show my ad, say, to whites or to Hispanics or you know, to Asians. And Facebook created a platform that uh, that allowed you to do that. And initially, Facebook copped to it. They're like, yeah, that's right, because you know. Uh, if you've got African American hair products, you're not going to advertise that, you know, to Asians. So yeah, if you've got housing, housing, and you want to reach certain populations, why can't you? And it was like, you know, in two days, I think they got lawyered up. They realized, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <that>? you know, <laughs> right. And and, and it, it it appeared to be this example of, I don't know, you know, people people who just hadn't been around much and didn't recognize that, well, no, in employment and in housing, you don't do that. You can't do that. And, you know, there's you know, not just laws, but, you know, all this case law. I mean, this is like, this is, you know, classic discrimination. And I think they were, well, I don't know if I want to attribute their motives, but, you know, they compared it to hair products. <laughs> and, uh, and so, at HUD, we very, when I was at HUD, you know, we very quickly um, began investigating that and engaged them and, uh, and they changed it, but it, it, you know, they, they, they could have changed it faster. I mean, it, it was surprising how long it took. Um, and, and there were still other you know, prohibited bases of discrimination that took them a while to address. Um, but that said, because this sort of niche marketing is uh, so popular uh, on the on the internet, uh, and you know people want to use it for all these other um, uses, which you know may not be as pernicious as housing and, and employment. Um, I know that HUD began looking at other entities, you know, after I left. Um, so it's something that we very much have to monitor uh, as a, as a country. Uh, I think we, we have to just be very wary. Of, be wary also of how AI is being used. Um, so much information that you know people want to use to to niche market, and which you know when it comes to housing would would exacerbate an existing problem that we have so many people living separately. Or, you know, um, you know we obviously have this problem with segregation in our metropolitan areas. So um, so yeah. So I just think as a society we have to be really vigilant. Uh, I'll also say that when I was at HUD in the 90s um, when people began advertising more housing on the internet and when craigslist for example became like a, a very popular spot to advertise housing um you know we had to deal with craigslist allowing third parties to post uh content that was discriminatory you know and craigslist said well you know we don't go in and alter what other people put up on on the pages you know we that's not our role. We want to, we, we want, you know, freedom to flourish and people to be able to say what they want in their advertising. And we had to tell Craigslist, that's not what, you know, you're now dealing with the Fair Housing Act here. Uh, and you're now dealing with the, the laws concerning advertising. Um, and uh, I went out to, to the Victorian row house that is Craigslist and sat down with them and we discussed what they can do, and they agreed to do some filtering of those advertisements so that uh, the, the worst discriminatory ads didn't show up. That there's some language that you know, or some combinations of words that never um, have a legitimate purpose in an ad, you know. Uh, and so, if, if words appeared in certain combinations, you, you knew there were a problem. And at least you can flag them and make sure they don't go up. And if someone, you know, was still trying to get that ad up and actually had some legitimate uh, word construction that I don't know somehow got inadvertently flagged. They they could work on that. So they did do some things to 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 improve that, and they put some education out there on fair housing. But yeah, as technology evolves, we're going to have to, to keep looking at that and and uh, you know see how the law gets at it because there actually is a great deal of immunity for what gets uh, posted in the internet, especially if it's posted by third parties and not by the uh, 
the internet provider themselves. But you certainly can't do what, uh, what, uh, what Facebook was doing, which was essentially uh, creating a platform that allowed you and maybe encouraged you to um, choose racial groups or other groups uh, based on demography to whom you want to target housing ads. I think in 2020 election and what we've seen with Parler and all these things have taught us a whole lot about the immunity that some of these companies um, have that have never been talked about. There's been a whole lot of discussion about that publicly. So there's a lot of, a lot of information out there, but it's interesting how the, the intersection of that, you know, we're going to give like a Facebook um, immunity from being held liable for stuff that's posted on their platform. But at the same time, like you can't create, tools that allow for such express. And I guess I didn't really contemplate that it was quite that explicit discrimination that was going on through that platform. And, and we did talk about how astonishing it was, how long it took for mm -hmm. them to address it and to react to it. That was like, this is a clear problem. And you would think that a giant tech company would have the tools to, to make this changed quickly, but right. they also don't want to in some respects. So um, yeah, kind of an interesting, a lot of, a lot of stuff. To yeah. Talk about you know, and, and it's, it, the other weird aspect to all of this is, you know, when you signed up for your Facebook account, uh, and I'm pretty confident that you didn't indicate what your race was. Right. So they actually do a deduction uh, based on your internet activity to determine what racial background you are. Um, so even that is just kind of weird, right? <laughs> so yeah. so th they're offering they're offering people uh, the opportunity to segment their 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 or, or target their marketing based on this other level of deduction about people's mm. background. Yeah, I feel like AI to a certain extent probably knows more about some people than they do themselves. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I remember having to go to Google. Uh, in Washington to their lobbying office for a meeting or something. And I, I, uh, I think I sent some friends a text saying I'm headed to Google. I, I, I think they, you know, I think they knew where I was before I did. <laughs> <laughs> It's always uncomfortable when you look at your Google Maps history. <laughs> exactly. Facebook sends you a notice that like, it looks like somebody uploaded a picture of you. And it's yeah. like, we are in the background of some photo and it recognized you. It's the crazy Amazing. thing, what they're doing now. Yeah. So. so you mentioned there's probably a lot of work to be done on like the online advertising tools. Because I was just thinking about Facebook in particular, if you're focusing on one entity, you know, they've limited how you can target real estate ads and how you promote houses for sale and things like that. But I wonder how far it'll go. Cause obviously there's still Facebook groups, there's uh, different pages, you know, and groups and pages are not demographically or racially. Um, I'm trying to think of the right word protected in a, in a sense, right. They can be very explicit in the group and the demographic that's in there. So, yeah. you know, I wonder if that's going to extend to, Hey, you can't post ads in this page or you can't post this link in this group. You know, how, how far yeah. does that go? So I, I think with the law, uh, so we're going to answer that question next week on Talking Real when we bring you part two of our conversation with Brian Green on all things modern issues in fair housing. Uh, you know, it's been a great, insightful conversation so far. We're going to finish up that conversation on fair housing issues in social media and online advertising. And then we're going to shift gears to some other topics and give you another half of the, the conversation that we had talking about fair housing stuff, which again, I think this conversation that we had today was super important. And the one we're going to have next week is just as important. Absolutely must listen. Mm -hmm. For sure. And I mean, I just want to throw it out there. If you've got some insight into how you think that question is going to be answered, send us an email, a podcast at okrealtors.com. I think it'd be interesting to see what people on the ground actually feel about the the restrictions and how they think they might evolve as well yeah 
Absolutely. Absolutely. So send us those emails. We'd love to hear that feedback. Hit us up anytime. Podcast at okrealtors.com. And in the meantime, I hope that you will share this episode and next week's with a friend in real estate because fair housing is not just an interesting thing to talk about, but it is an obligation of every single one of us in real estate that we have to be vigilant and we have to have a combined effort to make sure we're doing our part to ensure fair housing for all people. And so make sure you get educated on this. I think it's one of the most important things that we can do as an industry is be diligent in making sure that fair housing is a priority for all people. Mm -hmm. Well said. Can't add to that. There you go. So we'll see you next week on Talking Real for our second episode of this conversation with Brian Green, part two. We look forward to seeing you back then. And until next time, we'll see you next Tuesday on Talking Real. Talking Real.